Tonight's class, Why Jews Love to Argue, How a Great Virtue Can Turn into an Ugly Reality, is dedicated by a dear friend, Ira Pressman, in honor of his wife, Hannah, and his children, Allison Markowitz and David Pressman, for Hannah's children, Mike, Yosef, Usher, Hesh, Esti, and Sarah Lewis, and for Ira and Hannah's precious, beloved, and beautiful grandchildren, Noah and Jacob Markowitz and Eli Eli Pressman. Tonight's class is also dedicated in honor of Esther and Zalman Lubavik and family by our very own David and Ida Schattenstein. They tell the story about a fox which was, who was hungry. And he saw a lovely, a heavy, fat bird on top of a tree. And the fox thought to himself, this bird would be great to have for lunch. So he looks up to the bird and he says, my dear bird, why don't you come down from the tree and let us spend time together, enjoy each other's company. And the bird says, fox, you want me to come down from the tree? You will devour me. You will have me for lunch. You're Meshuggah, you're crazy. And the fox says, what are you talking about, my dear bird? Haven't you heard what the Lubavitchers, what the Chabadniks say, that the time of redemption has arrived? We're living in messianic times. Don't you know the prophecy of Yeshaya, of Isaiah, that when Mashiach comes, the wolf shall lie with the lamb, All of the animals will coexist in peace and in harmony. The old days of me eating you up, gone. A new era is upon us. Come down. We will schmooze, socialize, have a drink together, enjoy each other's company. The innocent bird was being persuaded by the powerful presentation of the fox and began making its way down from the tree. When suddenly the hunters arrived in the forest to begin their hunting and they sent out their dogs to sniff out the prey and the moment the fox hears that the dogs are approaching, the fox picks up its legs and begins to flee. And the bird asks the fox, where are you running to? From what are you running? And the fox says, don't you hear? The dogs are coming, the hunters are coming. They could kill me. And the bird turns to the fox and says, but I don't understand. You just explained to me that we're living in messianic times. The time of redemption is approaching. Everybody lives together in peace and harmony. Mashiach is about to come to the world. Why do you have to run? And the fox turns to the bird and says, yes, yes, you're right. But there's only one problem. The hint gleibenish the Mashiach. The dogs do not believe in the Mashiach. There is a medrash, a fascinating and intriguing midrash. The first midrashic tradition on the book of Eicha, on the book of Lamentations written by Yirmiyo Hanavi Jeremiah the prophet. That tragic document and book which is read by Jews the world over on the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Av, the day when we mourn the destruction of both temples, of both Beit HaMikdash, in the holy city of Jerusalem. And the Medrash begins its commentary on the book of Eicha with these words. You can open up your curriculum to source number one right below the video. Let us see the words inside. Shloisha Nisnabu Belashen Eicha 
three great giants in Jewish history have prophesied with the term Eicha. Eicha means how, alas, Moshe, Yeshaya, Yermia, Moses, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Moshe, Amar, Eicha, Esa, Levadi, Tarchachem, Umasaachem, Verifchem. Moshe Moses turns to the Jewish people and in the beginning of the portion of this week, Dvarim, he begins his final address to his nation a few weeks before he is about to bid farewell to his people and pass on. And Moshe turns to them and says, How can I carry all by myself your troubles, your burdens, and your strife? Yeshaya Amar, 700 years later, the prophet Yeshaya says in chapter 1 of the book of Isaiah of Yeshaya, Eicha haisa lezayna kiryana emona, mileyasi mishpot, tzedek yolin ba v'ata miratzch. Alas, how did a faithful city turn into a harlot? A city which was once filled with justice, where righteousness dwelled, now it's filled with murderers. Yirmiya Amar, the prophet Jeremiah says, in the first opening verse of his book of Eicha Lamentations, Eicha Yashva Vadad Ha'ir Abbasiyam, Haisa Kalmona Rabbasi Vagoyim, Sarasi Ba Medina Is Haisa Lamas. Alas! How a city with what, with, which was once populated with a great nation sits alone. It is like a widow. A city which had multitudes of nations, a princess among its provinces, has now become a tributary. Moshe, Yeshaya, and Yermia all prophesied with this word, Eicha. How? Alas. Eicha Esalavadi. Eicha Haisa Lazaina Kirya Namana. Eicha Yashva Vadad. Ha'ir Rabasiyam. And the Medrash continues Amar Reb Levi, Rabbi Levi explained Mashal Matruna Shayulash Laisha Shushvinin. Echadra Isa Beshalvasa. Echadra Isa Befachazusa. Echadra Isa Benivula. The metaphor for this is a princess, a queen, who had three people accompanying her, escorting her. The first one saw her in her state of tranquility. The second observed her in her state of frivolousness. And the third witnessed her in her state of disgrace. Eicha esa levadi tarchachem. Yeshaya raisa beisam befachazusam vamar eicha esa lezaina. Yirmiya raisam benevulam vamar eicha yashvavadot. Moses saw Israel in their glory and serenity and he says, How can I carry alone your burdens? Isaiah saw them in their frivolousness and he says, How has a faithful city become a harlot? Jeremiah saw them in their disgrace and he says, how such a great city is now so solitary and alone. What is the message of the Midrash? It is illogical to explain the message as the Midrash pointing simply out that these three great giants of Jewish history used the same word to begin a very powerful and dramatic prophecy. Lamentations chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Dvarim Yeshayo Yirmiya. Obviously, the Midrash means to say that there is a thematic link and connection, not just between the three words, but between the three messages which are being conveyed by Moshe Yeshayo Anavi and Yirmiyo Anavi. Hundreds of years apart. Yeshayo Anavi is approximately 700 years after Moshe. Yirmiya Anavi is approximately two centuries after Yeshaya. But there is some theme 
which pervades all of these three prophecies, hence they employ a similar term. The connection is not that they all use the same word. It's because there is a thematic link, thus they use the same term, Eich. But the question is, where is there a connection between these three prophecies? As the Medrash itself points out, Moshe Rabbeinu's Eicha cannot compare, be compared to Yeshaya's Eicha, and certainly not to Yermia's Eicha. Moshe is speaking to a nation in a state of serenity, tranquility, wholesomeness, about to enter into the promised land, a bright and beautiful future ahead of them. The connection between these three Eichas is also seen and discernible by the fact that all of these three echas are read always within the same week in the Jewish calendar, and it's this coming week. The following Shabbos, the portion of Dvarim, the Shabbos before Tisha B'av, as we read the Torah, the portion of Dvarim, the beginning of Deuteronomy, we will read and hear Moshe Rabbeinu's Eicha Esalavadi. The Haftarah of this Shabbos, Dvarim, the Haftarah of Chazoin Yeshayo, the, vis- the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amites, chapter 1 of the book of Yeshaya, we will read again, Eicha Haisal Azoyna Kiryana And a few days later, on the fast day of Tisha B'av, the ninth of Av, we read the third Eicha, Yirmiyo's Eicha Yashva Vadad Ha'ir Abbasiyam. What is more, according to some customs, during the reading of the portion on this Shabbos, when the Baal Kore, the person who reads the Torah, reaches the verse, Eicha Esalavadi, that verse he sings in the same tune in which we recite the book of Eicha, the very sad tune of Eicha of Lamentations. Eicha Yashva Vadad, Ho'ir Abosiyom. It's not a universal custom, but many communities have this custom. Why would we sing the verse Eicha Esel Levadi? When Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking to the Jewish people at a time of tranquility, why would we introduce the melancholy ballad characterizing the book of Lamentations we read on Tisha B'Av. All of this indicates, of course, that the Medrash is conveying to us here a message. Namely, the three Eichas are intertwined. The three themes are intertwined. Furthermore, they evolve one from another. Moshe's Eicha is what ultimately, centuries later, allows Yeshaya, Yeshayo's Eicha to emerge. Yeshayo's Eicha inevitably leads to Yermiyahu's Eicha Yashvavadat. Many interpretations have been presented over the generations to this intriguing Medrash. Tonight, the week of Dvarim, the week before Tisha B'av, I wish to present two interpretations. Two different perspectives. One I think you can define as more of a moral, ethical interpretation. The other is connected more to the philosophical, mystical, and spiritual perspective of reality. Perspective number one. What indeed was Moshe Rabbeinu crying about when he says, Eicha Esalavadi, Tarchachem Asaachem Verifchem. How can I carry alone your burdens, your troubles, your strife? At first glance, it would seem Moshe Rabbeinu is lamenting the fact that the Jewish people are a burdensome nation. It's a burden to carry you. You have a lot of troubles, you have a lot of strife, you quarrel. And how can I carry all of this alone? But if this really is the complaint of Moshe, and this is his final presentation when he opens his final address to the Jewish people, the question is, why doesn't he open up and ask the question, Eicha, how am I supposed to deal with the fact that you created a golden calf? The fact that you betrayed God's promise after the spies came back from the Holy Land. I mean, there were many things Moshe Rabbeinu could complain about. There were many great sins and transgressions and problems 
experience through the desert. And when Moshe Rabbeinu opens up his lamentation to the Jewish people, his address, he says one thing, Eicha Esa how can I carry alone all of your burdens? But the truth is, when we reflect on the verse, we can see that there is a deeper message here. Moshe Rabbeinu is not only complaining and lamenting the fact that he was given such hard work. How can I do all of this on my own? But the focus should be placed on one word, Levadi. Eicha es Levadi. How can I carry this alone? What really bothers Moshe Rabbeinu is that ultimately I am carrying this burden alone. The destiny, the history, the promise of Jewish existence ultimately falls on the shoulders of one individual. And it's me, it's Moshe Rabbeinu. Of course, there are many great people, well-educated Jews, refined Jews, pious Jews. Let us remember for a moment that the generation living in the desert, you may have developed a very negative outlook towards them when you read about their mutinies and revolts and demonstrations and disputations. Every Monday and Thursday, they staged another revolt. But let us remember, this is the only generation in history which heard God speak. Face to face, ponim be ponim, dibur Hashem imachem, Moshe would tell them in Dvor. Face to face, God spoke to you. I don't think we can say that about ourselves. At least I cannot say it about myself. I don't know about you. But remember, once you see God face to face and you hear God's voice, life is never the same afterwards. So we have to look at this generation with a different pair of lenses, from a different perspective. A Jew once came to the Kotsky Rebbe and said, Rebbe, why do we hold the Bible and the Chumash so sacred? It's filled with sins. That generation of Jews which came out of Egypt, all they did was sins. They complained, they lamented, they doubted, they screamed, they hollered, they revolted. And the Kotzke Rebbe said, Rebbe Yid, my dear Jew, let me tell you something. Funzeira Avedis is geschrieben geworden at Teira. Von deine mitzvahs wird kein Teira nicht geschrieben werden. From their sins, the Torah, the divine blueprint for life, was composed. I am fearful that from your mitzvahs, from your virtues, a Torah will not be written. This must give us perspective. Yes, Moshe knew this was a great generation. But yet at the end of the day he felt that he himself ultimately is carrying the burden. There are many people who will participate. They will come in at 9 o'clock a.m., punch the clock, do the work. But 5 o'clock p.m. they punch the clock. They have to go home to relax and go home to have dinner. There's only one person who will not be able to sleep at night because of his concern. Because the fact that in the consciousness of his heart he carries all the souls of Israel. Moshe was not complaining that summer months are coming and he can't go on vacation. Moshe was not complaining that he can't just sit near the pool and get a sunburn and enjoy his barbecue in the Catskill Mountains or wherever other people go for vacation in the summer. Every leader knows that part of being a leader means you carry the burdens of a nation which is filled with troubles, with strife, and with heavy burdens. Every leader knows there are all types of, forgive me, nudniks, which can drive you crazy and can make you mashuga. You know the story of the rabbi who a woman comes to meet him I think I shared it once, and she sits three hours complaining about her life, and when she gets up, she says, Rabbi, you're not only brilliant, you're also a miracle worker. And the rabbi says, why do you say so? She says, I came in with a migraine headache, and the headache is gone, it disappeared, you're a miracle man. And the rabbi says, no, the headache didn't disappear, it was just transferred from you to me. Any leader knows that many people project their problems, their insecurities on him or her. If you're the leader, you're guilty. 
People project their own issues on their leaders continuously. This is a fact of life, and if anybody knew it so well, it was Moshe Rabbeinu who knew it. What perturbed Moshe more than anything else was the sad fact that he felt that ultimately he himself is carrying the burden. Why am I the only one who really cares, who is not only passive, but is proactive? Why are there no other people who are active participants, not just in assisting and helping out in being part of it, but in really carrying the burden, standing up to the plate and taking on a position of leadership? And he felt there's only one person who, when the test, when the moment of truth comes, will really rise up and take a stand. This goes back to the genesis of his history. The first time we meet Moshe Rabbeinu, source number two in your curriculum. He grows up in a palace in Parsha Shmois. Of those days, Moshe grows up. He goes out to his brothers. And the first thing he observes is an Egyptian man beating a Hebrew from his brothers. Moshe turns here and he turns there and he sees there's no man and he strikes the Egyptian and he hides him in the sand and the commentators say, what do you mean nobody was there? The next day we see there were informers and there are different interpretations but one interpretation which has been said. Moshe looked here and he looked there and he saw there's no man who cares. Sure, there are people who are sitting in their jacuzzis will watch CNN and see the tragedies of the world, and they'll give a deep groan and sigh and send an $18 check. Sure, there are people who will attend a dinner, come to a lecture, write an email, but Vayar Kieni, she saw there's no man who's ready to stand up when an Egyptian is beating a Jew to death. Nobody is really ready to come out of their comfort zone and redefine their life as a leader. And Moshe at that moment had a choice. Will I join the rest of the club or will I say, because there is no man, I will be the man? We know the choice he made and the rest is history. So the Medrash says, when Moshe says, He saw them in their serenity. It doesn't only mean he saw them relaxed. He also saw them in a state of apathy, of relaxation. This doesn't mean they're not fine people. They're good people. They're pious people. They're divine people. As I said, this is a generation which saw God. But the Levadi was still present. Comes the Medrash and tells us from this Eicha, as subtle as the problem is, the second Eicha revolves. Because what happens now is, over the next centuries, As we observe, we study the Tanakh, we see there's a certain state of mass passivity which takes over the people. Of course, here and there, there are active and powerful and great leaders. But generally speaking, there's a certain sense of passivity or of complacency which characterize the nation. And thus, when there's only one person who really cares, when there's only one person who can't sleep at night, when there's only one person who thinks touch him to the core, a person who really takes responsibility and not just punches a clock or demonstrates that, yes, he has some interest. When you only have one such person and the rest of society, the rest of a community, of a nation, of a people, wants to relax, what that leads is to negativity blossoming. It's a question of time. So Yeshaya Hanavi, hundreds of years later, looks at Jerusalem and he says, what happened to this great city? What happened to a city that was so faithful? How did she become a harlot? Why a harlot? The definition of a zayna is somebody who stops caring. Somebody who subjects their sacredness, their sacred body to be violated, to be abused, to become just promiscuous. They just don't care. There's a certain destructive passivity of carelessness, of apathy, of indifference. 
I just have to fulfill another craving, another craving. There's no sense of, of, there's no core. There's no real conscience. There's no inner strength. It's the woman who just allows herself to be in any form and in any fashion, even when it undermines her very life, her very dignity, her very sense of selfhood. This is what happens, Yeshaya says, to a city which begins to love bribery, which begins to lose compassion for orphans, for widows. As he continues in this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 1, when only one person really cares, evil can blossom. What it takes for evil to blossom is not everybody being evil. It's just when the good people don't care enough to stand up, to take a stand, to become leaders. And this is what Yeshaya Hanavi's Eich is about. Nobody senses the urgency of the matter. There's no urgency. We'll call a meeting. The board will meet in three Thursdays. There's a great story. The story was told by the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1975, Tavshin Lamed Hay, by the great sage, the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Hakoyen Kagan. The great Chafetz Chaim once sends a delegation to meet the Prime Minister of Poland because there was a new decree which came out forbidding Shechita, ritual slaughtering of animals. So the Chafetz Chaim sends a delegation to meet the Prime Minister and persuade him to allow the Jewish community to continue practicing Shechita. The delegation meets the Prime Minister and then comes back to the Chafetz Chaim to give him a report. And when they come back to the Chafetz Chaim, he asks them how it went. They say it was unsuccessful. Why? And they explain they only knew Yiddish. So there was a translator to translate the Yiddish into Polish. But the translator wasn't a good translator. So therefore he did not know how to, gra he did not grasp, nor did he know how to convey their message efficiently. And thus their mission was unsuccessful. And the Chafetz Chaim asked one question. Why did nobody faint? If somebody would have fainted, the Prime Minister would have understood. Even if you're communicating in Yiddish. Because certain things transcend language. What the Chavetz Chaim was saying is, you spoke. The problem was Yiddish, wasn't a good translation. But why does nobody care enough? Why did it affect you to a point that you broke out, you broke down? The person saw there was a genuine concern, there was a genuine care. There was a heart, there was a soul. You weren't just doing your job so you can come back and say, I fulfilled my obligation, now I want paradise. So the three Eichas are very intertwined with each other. Moshe's Eicha as Levadi, when only one person really cares and is really, really feels the urgency, it leads to Yeshaya Hanavi's Eicha. Where negative forces, where injustice, where the absence of compassion, virtue, righteousness, morality, ethics can blossom. And that ultimately leads, it's only a question of time, to destruction, to erosion, to a point where a city is disgraced. And Yirmiyo Hanavi cries, Eicha Yashva Vadat. There is a second interpretation, and this one is based on a Hasidic work, Shem Mishmuel by Reb Shmuel of Sachachov, in the portion of Dvarim, at the end of Dvarim. He quotes the famous idea in many works of the great Jewish philosopher and thinker, the Maharal of Prague, Rabbi Yehuda Leva of Prague, the 16th century Polish Jew, becomes later the chief rabbi of Prague. 
The Maral points out that if you study Jewish history, you see that from the very genesis of Jewish history, there is separation. There is fragmentation. In the very beginning, Jacob, Yaakov, one of our founding fathers, doesn't marry one woman, Rachel. He ends up marrying Rachel and Leah, Bila and Zilpah. And they are the children of Rachel and they are the children of Leah. And there is a division between them epitomized by the division between Yosef, Joseph, the child of Rachel, Yehuda, the son of Leah. And this division just becomes more emphasized. And it evolves and becomes more sharp and more brutal as the generations progress. And the Maral explains that the reason that this division is right there in the Genesis is because the division in the Jewish world is actually not a flaw of the Jew, it's a virtue of the Jew. It's a great idea of the Maral. The Maral says if Jews were simpler, if they were more primitive, if they were more uh, earthy, unity between them would be far easier. But because the Jewish people have a very profound intellectual, cognitive, and spiritual power, so as the rabbis say in the Talmud and Brachas and Sanhedrin, Ein Deyosei and Shavas. No two minds are alike. The mind is a field, an arena of endless diversity. The world of intellectualism and the world of spirituality, the world of transcendence, is endlessly diverse. Every human being has another feeling, another perspective, another way of experiencing God, of experiencing life. The universe of the soul and the world of the intellect is extremely fragmented and diverse. So as much, as, as much division and diversity there is in all of existence, there is even more diversity within the Jewish psyche, within the Jewish existence. By the Jews, Maral says, there's a unique emphasis on individualism. Because in the world, the more sensitive you are to the intellect, to transcendence, to that which transcends the concrete physical, the more sensitive you are to the world of ideas and to the world of the spirit, the more diversity, the more pathways. And therefore, everyone has their hashkafa, their perspective, their vantage point. And the individualism is extremely powerful. So the Maral says, it's integral to Jewish existence. I once heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a very humorous line. He said in 1985, I think it was, 1985 with Kislev, the 10th of Kislev, he said, why is it when two Jews meet, I tell you, Shalom Aleichem, and you respond, Aleichem Shalom. Peace unto you, and your response is unto you, peace. Why don't you respond in kind? I say, Shalom Aleichem. Your response should be, Shalom Aleichem. And the Rebbe said, because when two Jews meet, even if I tell you only two words, Shalom Aleichem, peace unto you, your first response immediately is, no, you got it all wrong. It's exactly the other way around. It's not Shalom Aleichem. It's Aleichem Shalom, unto you, peace. Now we can begin to shmuas. So according to the Maharal, this is inherent to the Jewish psyche collectively and individually. Asks the say, Shem Shmuel, Jewish literature is saturated with the idea that the separation between Jews is a terrible reality. In fact, the Talmud says in Tractate Yuma, it was the cause for the destruction of the second temple, Sinas Chinam, the hatred among Jews. Our literature is filled with the idea that our greatest problem, our greatest challenge is the disunity, the disharmony, the infighting within the Jewish people. And yet the Maharal is so complementary of this fragmentation and dichotomy. How do you explain it? And the Shem Shmuel says there is no contradiction here. It depends what diversity and individuality are used for, how they are expressed, how they are employed. If we use this power of individuality, this very deep sense of self in contrast to another self for sublimity, for spirituality, for fine transcendental reality, then it is great. It's awesome. 
in the world of the spirit, in the world of the mind, arguments are good. Arguments are healthy. Arguments are productive. They enrich the spirit. They broaden our perspective. They expand our horizons. Source number four, source number three, is the famous Gemara in Kiddushin. Taflamet, page 30b, on the verse in Chukas, al Kain ye Omar b'seifrim ulchamas Hashem ezvoyev b'sufa. Says the Talmud, Omar ebchiyeh barab, afilu ha'avu b'noya rave talmidoy sh'oiskin b'toyda, b'shar echod nasim oivim zezeh, ve'enam zazim isham at sh'oyavim zezeh, at sh'nasim oyavim zezeh, sh'nemer ezvoyev b'sufa al tikri b'sufa ala b'soifa. As Rashi explains the meaning of the Talmud, sometimes there are mulchamais Hashem caused by the Sefer, by the book. A father and a son, a teacher and a student are sitting in yeshiva, studying Torah and arguing. If you ever went into a yeshiva and you don't know what type of environment it is, you may be shocked. It looks like people there sitting against each other are enemies. There is sometimes screaming and hollering. One yeshiva student is pointing his finger at the other one and says, you don't know what you're talking about. Or in Yiddish it's even better, the haks the chaynik. You're confusing the ideas. You totally didn't grasp it. This is pure ignorance. And you think, whoa, these guys must really hate each other. And then they finish learning their best friends. Because this type of argumentation is not a contradiction to love. On the contrary, the Talmud says a father and a son, a teacher and a student are fighting with each other, are debating, because that's how you learn Torah. You have this perspective, I have this perspective, I understand it this way, you understand it this way. I'm wrong, you're wrong, I'm right, we're both right, we're both wrong. And we become enemies, but nobody will leave the yeshiva until they become best friends. Esvaiv besufa, there's love at the end. Source number four, the Medrash Tehillim and the Yerushalmi tell us, The words of Torah were not given to Moses in a clear-cut, decisive fashion. On every idea which God communicated to Moshe, he explained to him 49 reasons why it's pure and 49 reasons why it's impure. So Moshe asks God, how do we have a halach? How do we have a verdict? And he says, you follow the majority. But just because you follow the majority does not mean that the other opinions don't have a nucleus of truth. Source number five in your curriculum, the famous Gemara in Erev in Dafyud Gimel Amit Beis. For three years, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel were arguing with each other. Hillel said, Each group said, The verdict follows our opinion. A voice came out and said, Both of their opinions are the, are the words of a living God. But they have opposite opinions. But in the world of the spirit, in the world of the intellect, there are polarities. There are different en- energies. There are different states of consciousness. There is a reality called chesed. It's true. Love, kindness, grace. There's a reality called gvura, strength, intensity, discipline. It's also true. Hillel comes from the world of chesed. Shammai comes from the world of gvura, of strength, of discipline. This is true. This is true. They're both expressions of the living God. The living God is not defined by one color, by one shape, by one dimension, by one perspective. Each reality, each emotion, each experience captures part of the truth. Nobody captures all the truth. Together, together we we create a larger truth. So the diversity inherent in the Jewish people, according to the Maharal, is an expression of their calling to a life of extremely intense spirituality, 
The job of the Jew is to engage in a daily battle for transcendence. And in the world of the spirit, in the world of the intellect, diversity is not a curse, it's a blessing. As I said, it enriches the spirit. It captures the various gems of truth. It advances the mind. It allows a soul to grow. The richest composition of the Jewish people was what? Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud. Did you ever learn Talmud? Every page of the Talmud is fraught with arguments, debates, disputations. Did you ever open up a medrash? Open up a medrash rabbi. Read it. You'll see there's an opinion, a commentary on a verse. Next line. Davaracher. Another interpretation which is very different. Three lines later. Davaracher. Three lines later. Davaracher. Another perspective. Another perspective. Another perspective. Usually the perspectives are contrary to each other. But when you take the same power of individuality, when you take the same susceptibility to diversity which comes from a deep appreciation of the fact that I have a perspective and you have a very different perspective, when this very same characteristic is used for physicality, for materialism, for earthiness, and for self-indulgence and self-gratification, when the same power of individuality is directed towards petty reality, we end up quarreling with each other and killing each other. Back to that verse in Chukas. There's an interpretation. Al ye Omar Hashem. The wars for God should be fought only be safer on the book, in a book. But when they become fights between people, when they destroy our interpersonal relationships, when families stop talking and communicating to each other, when communities split, when siblings split, when people start experiencing jealousy and envy and competitiveness and hatred, and you did this to me and I think you did this to me and I need more attention and you need more attention and I want power and you want power and I want this position, I want this position. Here suddenly a powerful virtue turns into an ugly reality. But safer in the book, Mulchamas Hashem are beautiful. All of the Svarim, all the books of Yiddish got are filled with Mulchamas Hashem. But when this competitive power when this emphasized sense of individuality is taken out of the book, it's taken out of the world of the spirit, it's taken out of a world of transcendence where we're searching for a truth beyond us, and you have your opinion, and I have my opinion, and you have your feeling, and I have my feeling, when it's taken out from that realm, and it lands into the planet Earth, and it becomes political, and personal, and materialistic, and narcissistic, oi gewalt. You know, right, about the shul, there was a shul where uh, there was some arguing. What else is new? But there's one particular shul <laughs> where they had this fight every Shabbos. Do you stand by Kaddish? Do you sit by Kaddish? So first there was a debate and a conflict, but then it became out of hand. And they were killing each other. Every Shabbos there was another war in the shul. So they decided you can't have a shul, you can't have a synagogue this way. So they go to the old age home and they find a Jew who's 104 years old. He was from the original founders of the synagogue some 70, 80, 90 years ago. And they come and they visit him. One group comes to him and says, listen, we have a very important question. When they instituted and founded this shul, tell us by the Kaddish, did you sit or did you stand? And he said, I don't remember. I don't remember. Okay, the next week the other group comes. Tell us, did you sit or did you stand? You stood, right? He said, I don't remember. So the next week both groups come together. They come together. First week, one group came to sit and you stand. He says, I don't remember how they did it. The second week, he also didn't remember how they did it. So the third week, they both come together. And this one is trying to persuade him. And this one is trying to persuade him. And in the middle, they start getting into a war. And they're hollering and screaming at each other, standing, sitting, standing, sitting. And the old man looks up and says, this is how they did it. 
You know that anecdote about the Jew who decides he's fed up with the politics in this community. He's building a community for himself in a barren island. And he builds, of course, a golf course, a kosher sushi bar, a kosher Chinese restaurant, and all of the indispensable components which a Jew needs, a cemetery, a hospital, probably a gym, a health, re- a health, a health restaur- healthy restaurant, and he also builds two synagogues. So somebody asked him, you're going to live there yourself, you don't even have a minion, why do you need two shuls? He, says, he points to one, he says, that's the shul I won't step foot into. And this is what we are experiencing here. The Jewish people were made, they were fashioned, they were designed to represent something in the world, to represent something for themselves and for the people around them, to represent a continuous conversation of self-refinement, of self-transcendence, of soaring to touch the divine. And in that realm, Individuality is gewaldic. It's beautiful. It's necessary. It's vital. It's healthy. It's productive. It's enriching. But when we degrade ourselves and we lose our interest in transcendence, so then the very same personality traits are now directed into earthly pursuits. Money, power, real estate, Glory, egotism, all types of politics, personal quarrels, business. Who speaks to who, doesn't speak to who, took revenge, who didn't take revenge. And then, our love for argument becomes an invitation for for chaos. These are the three echas. Moshe Rabbeinu turns to the Jewish people and says, How can I carry alone your troubles, your burdens, your quarrels? So the Medrash says, Moshe saw them in their state of serenity and tranquility. According to the Midrash, what we are learning here is a very powerful idea. Moshe is explaining how hard it is, but he's actually complimenting the situation. This is shalva. This is the wholesomeness of the Jew. The fact that it's so difficult to carry you because you have so many different opinions, because there's so much individuality, because everybody has something to say. Everybody opens their mouth. Right? They say, I think that uh, President Eisenhower met Ben Gurion. And he says, Mr. Ben-Gurion, you look so depressed. What's the problem? Ben-Gurion says, my country. He says, I don't understand. Here in America, hundreds of millions of people, tens and tens of millions of people. What do you have there? You have a few million Jews. A few million people, a few million Jews. How do you compare? I should be the one in a bad mood. I should be the one stressed out. You have a small, little, tiny country, Israel, with a few million people. He says, Mr. President Eisenhower, you don't understand. You may have 200 million people living in the United States of America, but they are 200 million citizens. I have a few million Jews living in the state of Israel, but they are a few million prime ministers. It's a different story. Moshe Rabbeinu says, How can I carry this alone? It's Shalva. Moshe was complimenting the potentially exalted state of the Jew who is so individualistic, who have so many opinions because in the world of the spirit is endless because the more you're in touch with godliness, the more diversity there is because godliness is infinite and when you touch infinity, there are infinite ways of explaining infinity because that's the nature of infinity. The higher you go to the world of the divine, the more possibilities there are, the more levels there are, the more states of consciousness there are, the more adventure, the more creativity, the more individualism. And they all have place for each other. 
They all have respect and space for each other. What happens, however, is the Jewish people take tarchachem, asachem, verifchem, your troubles, your burdens, your diversity, your strife, and often direct it towards very earthy matters. And here, the competition becomes a cause of conflict and head-in-head collisions and sometimes war. So what does Rashi say in the final source number six? Rashi says, what type of burdens did Moshe have? They were heretics. If Moshe came out early from his house, they said, why did he leave his house early? Ah, there's probably fighting going on in his home. If Moshe came out late, they said, why is he coming out late? Ah, he's probably scheming plans against us. How to undermine us, how to destroy us. Imagine what is happening. Here you have the greatest prophet in history who spoke to God face to face at any moment. Every movement of Moshe Rabbeinu was an explosion of spirituality in the world. And here you have Jews who saw everything and who knew Moses. And when he comes out early of the house, they say, ah, he probably got into a fight with his wife. He comes a little late, ah, he's probably planning to destroy us. And this is what he's dealing with. That sense of politics and individualism, when it's directed towards the world of the spirit, it's graceful. When it's directed towards the world of the ego, it becomes an arena of conflict because egos have a very big problem and a hard time yielding and creating space for each other. So what happens is Yeshaya Hanavi's Eicha, Eicha Heisalazayna Kiryana Mana. How does a faithful city become a harlot? A city which was filled with justice is now filled with criminals, conflict, disrespect, disharmony, bloodshed, a lot of fighting. And this results ultimately in the Eicha Yashva Vada, the solitariness of which Jeremiah about which Jeremiah cries, the destruction of Jerusalem, politically, physically, and also emotionally. Everybody is alone. Everybody's in solitary confinement. There's no cohesiveness, there's no trust, there's no true love, and there's no friendship. So the three Eichas are interconnected with each other. Eicha Esalavadi, that experience which Moshe is lamenting, can be the greatest virtue or it could become the most ugly reality. We are called to decide which Eicha we're going to allow to emerge. Have a good night. <laughs> Oh, da 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 da